What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. Today with me, I have guest Dr. Roger Bales, who is a professor of engineering at, U, at UC Merced and a professor, uh, an adjunct professor at UC Berkeley. Welcome to the show, Roger. I'm very happy to be here, Rick. Thank you. So I, I find the best way to start an interview with someone such as yourself is is kind of to give our listeners a little bit of background information on, you know, tell them who you are and what you do. Well, I'm a, I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering. My spouse, Martha Conklin, and I moved from University of Arizona to start this new University of California campus in Merced in 2003. So we left a very comfortable jobs as full professors at a established university to move to a place that didn't even have the buildings built yet. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was, it's been quite a ride since then with California's ups and downs in the economy. But we're up to 10,000 students now, mm -hmm. about 15% of graduate students, or 10, 10, 10 to 15% graduate students. We're serving the Central Valley of California, which didn't have the university before that. So we decided it was the right time in our life to do something different and, and to help this, this region build a new university. I'll date myself, but back in the early 1970s, when I was an undergraduate in engineering at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Oh, right on. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Boilermakers, right? <laughs> Drew Brees. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I was say, my dad coached at Purdue University for a long time, for about 10 years, so I'm very familiar with Purdue. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's a great place to, to, uh, to have started out. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in civil engineering, and, and then the, the uh, environmental legislation was passed by Congress, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act. And I said, hey, that's, that's what I want to do. I don't want to build bridges and, and, and buildings. I want to clean up the nation's waters. I want to clean up the nation's air. I want to make this a better place to live. And... Uh, I, I worked for, um, had, I was working part time for the U.S. Navy at a, at a military base. They were actually building bombs oh. <laughs> for the Vietnam War at the time. But, oh, snap. Um, but my job was to assess the pollution and help come up with cleanup strategies. Oh, really? And, and as a student, this was a great thing to do. I was working with a mature scientist, a, you know, a seasoned scientist. So, I started doing field work and I realized that, hey, if we're going to solve these problems, we need data. We got to get out and do measurements. So ever since then, I've built my career on making good measurements. Advances in, uh, in hydrology, which is what I do most of, the science of water, like in any field, is built on good data and measurements. You can't just intuit your way out of these things like you might in theoretical physics or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. You've got to have, you've got to have data and you've got to have evidence. And the whole environmental revolution is, is built on data. So, you know, after that, I moved to California for, it was introduced to UC Berkeley as a master's student and worked on problem solving and <clears throat> water and wastewater for, for five years and said, Hey, it's time for me to become a professor. So I went back to school and got my PhD and, when I finished, I moved to Arizona and then back to California, where uh, it's really a bigger platform. I think if California can't save the world, I don't know who can these days. That, in terms of <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting that's an interesting thought. Why? What? I've never heard that before. And what makes you say if California can't save the world, then who can? Like what? What? Yeah. Why do you say that? That's interesting. We need to make investments to combat the climate crisis and linked things like inequality and racism and so forth, uh, you know, globally. And California has, at this moment in time, the political will, the wealth, and the support of the electorate to do that. Mm -hmm. And you don't find that combination in very many states of the United States. So... 
we really have the opportunity, I think, to be out in front on on some of these global challenges. Absolutely, that's an inter- that's an interesting way of looking at it, and I and I can't say that you know I, I disagree. You have a lot of problems, but you, you know, you are, you know, at the, the forefront of, of finding solutions and we'll get into the solar aqua grid a little later, but in terms of like water, right. Um, a lot of the, where you're at, especially, um, in the central Valley, that's a problem. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could kind of, uh, let us know how big of a problem it is in terms of like wasting water and like what are some of the the solutions that y- you guys have thought up in order to fix this problem? Well, water is always something that's been in dispute, I think, mm-hmm. in, in California. The... Uh, there's an error that says I've run out of disk space. Oh. You're good. We're 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 uh, we're pulling this recording. It's actually recording within this uh, software that we're running. So you're all good. So look at it. Look at it this way. Uh, California receives an average of about two feet of precipitation per year yep. across the state, and the state's 100 million acres. So if you convert that to a volume, that's 100 million acre feet. Or, 200 million acre feet, Mm -hmm. two feet deep times 100 acres. Now, of that 200, about 120 million acre feet is used in our headwaters, in our forest. It goes back to the atmosphere to keep the trees healthy and and uh, and, and, uh, and everything else, the ecosystems we depend on. So that leaves 80 million acre feet of runoff. Now, of that 80 million acre feet, half of it flows to the ocean to keep our ecosystems healthy, our Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta, some rivers you can't put dams on because they're too steep. So so that leaves about 40 million acre feet for agriculture and municipalities combined. Now of that 40 million acre feet, 80% of it goes to agriculture Mm -hmm. and 20% of it to the municipal, the urban areas. Now, we have more land than we do water. That uh, that eighty percent of of forty million acre feet is thirty two million acre feet on average. Uh, it, it varies from year to year depending on precipitation, and pretty much all of our agriculture is irrigated agriculture because our rain falls in the in the winter time and crops need it in the summertime. So we store it over to to summer. So right now we haven't had much precipitation the last few years and we're running out of stored water (laughs) in some, in some areas. We're trying, we're, we're pumping water out of the ground that may not be replenished. Yeah. And I I was going to ask you about that. You're, you're, when you say stored waters, you're referring to the underground water aquifers, correct? Yeah. Well, there's, that's that's the big that's the biggest storage, but there's also dams. Okay, uh, so both and and another storage is our snowpack, yep. but that's diminishing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so so that's that's the giant problem now. In terms of like you said, eighty percent of that water goes towards agriculture, and the other twenty percent goes to urban areas. Do you think that this that the state and and again and I want to don't want to point any fingers I'm just spitballing here. Do you think that some of the the agriculture that has been implemented is problematical? Mm-hmm. I think that I, I I believe I read somewhere that almond that a lot of the almond groves or orchards um, take a ridiculous amount of water as well. So that might be problematical. I can't off the top of my head. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But I, I'm I'm wondering, like, if I could get your thoughts on that. Well, there's there's a couple of issues there. First of all, the people that are using the water have a legal right to use the water. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, and and almonds are one of our largest uh, agricultural exports. We uh, California supplies oh, 90 percent of the world's almonds. Wow. And we're exporting a lot of water when we do that. 
we still, with the water that's remaining, we we grow, you know, about a, what, a third of the, the nation's fruits and vegetables and, and nuts and over half of just the fruits and nuts wow. that serves our, our, our nation. So, yes, we, we could change the water rights and try to prioritize, but do we want to make societal decisions or do we want to let landowners make those decisions? Property rights holders, whether they own the land or the water or both. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I don't have uh, no comment there because I'll, I'm going to definitely side with, uh, you know, the individual liberty and whatnot, but it is an interesting, you know, th- thought process or an, an interesting thought that, um, you know, in your opinion, is that a large portion of the problem is that we not, might not be growing the best, uh, the most suitable produce well, for the region? I, I think I think that you have to look at it and decide if your worldview is to make society better or to have you know free property rights yeah. and let people do what they want. And and that's that's a constant struggle because in this constitution of the California water belongs to the people. Yeah. But but people have established water rights to use it. Yet on the other hand, we have rural communities that don't have water. And we have ecosystems that don't have water rights. So there's a societal interest that's not being met. Yeah. With the current system. Man, that okay, yeah, we got into the weeds real quick. We start talking about this is this <laughs> is something though that is important because it's not something for where I live, the region I live in, water's not really an issue, right? It might be at some point in time, God willing, it that doesn't, you know, I don't live through that and no one else does, but that's not something that I think about in terms of where I live, but like where the, there's a scarcity of water, uh, that's getting very, very complicated because you don't want to infringe on someone's liberties, right? And their ability to make a living yet, like if this resource runs out, then no one can live there and it things get yeah. real ugly really, really quick. And then, you know, you, you also said something that I thought was pretty profound is the ecosystem also is being denied. And if your ecosystem crashes, then not a lot of people can live there. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's complicated. Well, I think you're, what well, you're getting at a really good point that, you know, society as we know it <laughs> depends on having healthy ecosystems, biodiversity, and, every, you know, so many things we, we depend on uh, for to make life the way it is, is having healthy ecosystems. And globally in the United States and California, there's now this 30 by 30 initiative to set aside 30% of our land and coastal waters for its biodiversity value by 2030. Okay. It's, it's been in, embraced, uh, you know, all the way along the, the chain from the United Nations down through the, some states like California. So does this mean that it turns into like public land where, you know, there'll be like trails and, and what, I'm, I'm kind of confused at what that means. When you say set aside land, does that mean it's state owned land that everyone can go on or how does that work? That means we don't convert it to crop land or infrastructure. Okay. Okay, sweet. So it's like it's a protected area then. All right, much like Yellowstone. Yeah, and the I mean, you, you may graze cattle on it or something like that, but you're not doing row crops or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah because that's we 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 that's a reoccurring theme on uh, some of our uh, bummer casts is when we start talking about uh, the lack of uh, how we I can't think of the word right now, but. Um, monocrop agriculture and how we don't do crop rotations and we grow large, large, like hundreds of miles. Maybe that's, let's say thousands and thousands of acres of soy and all these things that just strip the soil of all of its value. Like the, these are, these are some of the issues that, you know, we have to tackle in the future. One thing, but I don't want to go down that road. Cause that's a, that's a depressing uh, road to go down. But w- one of the things I did want to ask you, and this is a bit controversial is wh- what are your thoughts on dams? Because dams are, some people view them as a necessary, you know, evil, and other people view them 
as like the worst thing ever in terms of like destroying fisheries and, and whatnot. Like I, it's, I, I feel like when we were first building dams in this country, I don't think we really cons- considered or had the foresight to see the havoc that that would re- that that would uh, have on some of the fisheries and the salmon runs. Um, I think that there was another big uh, John. You might need to pull this up. I want to say it's like the, a copper something copper mine in Idaho or something like that, where um, they were going to dam this river up and it was going to ruin the fisheries. I don't. I don't know. It's a, it was a huge thing in the uh, the 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 hunting community, but. Um, I just I would like to get your your viewpoint on what you think of of dams. I mean it's that's a it's a very I'm sure it's a complicated issue and and it's got a lot of sides and probably a lot of emotion but um what does Roger think of dams? Well right now dams provide value quite a bit of value to the way our cities and society has developed in the Western U.S. and, and other, other places. We think about the, the huge hydropower, the electricity generation on, uh, you know, on Hoover Dam and, and other dams. The Bonneville the Dam. Well, the same. Yeah, yeah. So we've built up. So, and... The, you know those those are those are existing infrastructure. Now we might not build them. We probably wouldn't build them if they weren't there. Now, when people ask me, I say I just don't see the people of California voting for a bond to build another dam on a river. Yeah. the The only dam that's in planning in California is is off off the river right now, and it's for story. It's for water storage potentially hydroelectricity and and also it can release water you know as as needed for both ecosystem values as well as agriculture but dams we built dams in part for flood control but in part because we wanted to use the floodplains which is what used to provide flood control people wanted to farm those so, so there were really very strong special interests that wanted to develop the land that were advocates for these dams. And they got the support of enough people that they got Congress and the state legislature to uh, put the money up front yeah. to build these dams and do the engineering on them. And then they got the water rights to use the water from, from the dams. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they're there and we're making the best use of them that we can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I was, I was picking up what you're putting down there. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> it's, fun, it's fun, funny how that works, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if, at this point it cost it would cost a lot of money to remove dams. There are four dams that are supposed to be removed on the Klamath River next year. Mm -hmm. And they, at this point, it costs more to operate them than to remove them. (laughs) They're not, they're not making money for anybody. Oh, really? Yeah. I, 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 I I sometimes think about um, more people are switching over to electric automobiles because of the price of gas. And I think that we're only going to see the demand for electricity but I recently had an interesting conversation with someone that works for um, a utility company that that uh, deals in power, and um, he he mentioned that a big problem that we're going to see is since people are going to be charging their cars, there might the demand for electricity is about to go up, and we might not have enough electrical power on the grid to support that. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people are talking about and foreseeing, but I definitely would love to know if that's a conversation that's going on in some of your circles. Oh, it definitely is. And the state of California has projections for how much more electrical capacity and how much more electricity we need to generate to meet the uh, 20, 
30 goals and 2045 goals and so forth of the state, yet they don't have a firm plan to get there. I know how we could get there. Okay. I'm all ears. Are you ready? I, I know how we can do it. No problem. No questions asked. Now there, there's a minor cost, <laughs> nuclear energy. Okay. I, I don't, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. I feel like we already have the solution. Uh, Nixon had an, an initiative to have 500 nuclear reactors built across. And then I know it, it seems crazy, but um, we're working on getting a, uh, a nuclear engineer that has designed a new type of reactor yeah. to where it self contains um, if it, if it were to malfunction. So there wouldn't be any, v- barely any uh, issues or of nuclear waste. And I just wonder it, it, in the circles that you run in, is this something that people are, are, are considering? Cause there's been a lot of advancement advancing in this. And I think that as we shift away from fossil fuels, you know, because, Nuclear fusion with ITER, we've had uh, we've had some experts on here to talk about that. That's you know whether that goes fusion is a is is feasible. I, I believe it is, but like it's not there now, and and it, not at the speed that we need it. So I'm thinking that the only really so the re- only real solution that we have would be nuclear, but it has such bad press. And I wonder if is this something that in the circles that you run with that you guys are discussing? Well, the. I- it has. It does come up sometimes in a couple of contexts. And going back to my my student days when I was studying economics, I, I, I did take a, a besides engineering, I took a degree in economics along the way. And for decades, you know, we we looked at the literature, and for decades, the U.S. had no new orders for nuclear power plants because they just don't pencil out in the market. Mm-hmm. Now, there's multiple reasons for that, but you know, one big reason, there are a couple of big reasons. There's huge capital yeah. investments, and and you you've got to tie up quite a bit of capital to get there. And and second, we still don't have a good way to dispose of the waste from the current technology that's out there, and that that's a societal cost that not many people are willing to bear. They don't want it in their backyard. No, no, they don't want I know that. that's a big, that's <laughs> a big, I know that's always a big selling point where, where someone's like, well, would you live in a place that had a nuclear reactor? I did. I lived at, uh, in Corvallis. There's a nuclear reactor there and it didn't seem yeah. to bother me. Um, you know, but it's pretty ugly on the landscape, right? If you, if I don't, I think of like uh, the the Chernobyl uh, nuclear reactors, and I, I can't think of any other ones that I've visited. But they seem like they're they're just massive structures that are kind of an eye source. If you could maybe get rid of that, scale it down, maybe we could yeah. sell it. I don't know. Well, the, yeah, I, I'm not ruling out all nuclear technology. I just can't see. Uh, I, I just can't see us making investments in these expensive big facilities that take 20 years to get build and get online when we can we can put solar over our roofs, over our carports, over our canals, over our parking lots at a much lower cost of installed capacity, even including storage, mm-hmm. electricity storage. Uh, and and we can do wind. I mean, I, I think at this point, solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, geothermal are going to pencil out much better than big nuclear plants using the current technology that people are, are offering. I th- yeah, I think that's fair. And I think that this is a pretty good segue. But before we get, John, you had something you wanted to say. What, what was that? Oh, um, <clears throat> well, I was just going to bring up that there was just, uh, I believe, the past this past week, yeah, uh, a few weeks ago, actually, there was a study released by uh, an environmental scientist at Stanford, or a group of scientists at Stanford, that had determined that based on their calculations of uh, GDPs of 145 countries in the world, that if all of the countries total would put all of their effort into 
making use of whatever renewables we can with the technology we have right now. This isn't dependent on growing and developing new technology that it would cost roughly 65 trillion dollars to solve global warming and that the because of all of the cost saving mechanisms that are built into renewable energies within six years we would completely pay off uh what it would cost to do uh, yeah i i don't know the study you're talking about john but i it really does pencil out the the benefits are a no brainer compared to the in, investments as long as we make smart investments and put the solar and wind in the right places that don't have huge ecosystem uh, ecosystem impacts or or ecosystem or impacts such as cultural because <laughs> we have there's been a lot of pressure to put them on native american uh, land that's input that is um, of strong interest to Native Americans in, put, in some states. Put did you put what on Native American lands again? Solar. Oh wait, for for real? Not 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 on not on land that is owned by Native Americans, but that is under some uh, government ownership, but has uh, both ecosystem and sacred value. Oh. oh. Damn, we're doing it again, son of a bitch. Uh, that's terrible. So, so we got we got to be smart about what what we put, where we put our solar yeah. and our wind. Yes, yes, totally understand. Um, I think that this is probably a good segue for the solar aqua grid. So, if you could explain what that is to the layman, because it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. We were a, a few years ago. We were approached by an an energy company to uh, to do a, and and a potential project developer to do a study to really do a good economic and feasibility analysis of putting solar over canals in California. And you know, California is about four thousand miles of open canals, and we estimated that if we covered all of them, that would get us halfway to our 2030 goals for renewable, additional renewable energy in the state. So that land area using already disturbed land is just makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. for that. So that, that, that was one of the motivations for doing it because we know it's going to cost more just to build it and install solar when you have to have a little bit of customization of the design versus if let's say you Rick own, you know, a hundred acre field and you're not doing anything with it and you want to make some money off of it. Okay. You'll sign up with somebody to put solar on it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, that may be a uh, land that either is productive farmland or it may be land with a high biodiversity value that uh, should be, maybe used you know, less intensively used mm -hmm. so you're so the the plan is to cover all of the the canals with like are you building like bridges that are across the canals or just like like metal f uh, i don't know bridges are the first thing that come to mind but how like what's kind of the engineering of how this is going to be set up right now we have uh, a prototype project <clears throat> under 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 design and hope to start building on it this fall in partnership with an irrigation district in the Central Valley of California, Turlock Irrigation District, mm -hmm. which is the oldest irrigation district in the state, a very uh, and, and an electricity provider as well as a water provider, has a, a very uh, I think forward looking outlook on what they need to do to both serve both their customers and and do it in a in a sustainable way. So they offered to cover uh, some of their canals as part of the demonstration and to work the bugs out of the design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's it's conceptual now. There have been some of these canals covered in. Uh, in India successfully, but the, it's a little different technology and it doesn't work so much because we have different ways in the U.S. of 
building the canals, of doing maintenance on them. And we need some equipment access, I think, whereas some of the work in India maybe is done more by hand. Mm -hmm. And so our, our design has to be a little different for that, for that purpose. Uh, so think of it as, let's say you're building a, a carport or something, you'll build, uh, you know, uh, uh, you put some posts up and then you'll build some roof joists or you know, supports across it and then put the roof on it. Well, it's similar to covering a canal. If, if the canal isn't, isn't too wide, you can put a post on one side and cantilever the panels off over it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if it gets too wide, then you have to put supports on both sides. Okay. Okay. So that, and now that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now that that's, that's for canals that don't get too wide and that's, those are steel, but then when they get much wider, we, um, we use a cable suspension, think like a cable bridge or something. So it's a, it's a lighter weight lighter weight thing but then you have to anchor them back a little ways from the canal to hold them in place okay so so it's different designs depending on how wide your canal is <laughs> okay all right and so this is this is obviously to, to to harness the power of the sun but isn't it also a dual purpose initiative isn't it also to stop evaporation or did was i am i making that up in my mind it should reduce evaporation. Yeah, and, and no, you didn't make that up. That's that's exactly, that's why, uh, you know, after we published that paper, we were getting calls from and emails from zillions of people saying, hey, you know, that's an idea I had years ago to save water and produce more water and so forth. And we said, yeah, yeah we all, great minds think alike <laughs> along these things. So, I have kind of a goofy question. Now, I'm assuming, and, and now the more I think it out, the more goofy I, I, I think it is, but I would assume that there's going to be, especially in the summer, there's going to be potentially some heat rising. Is there a way to capture that energy that you guys have thought about? Well, by... by uh not not necessarily by putting the but by putting the canals over the water that has a little bit of a cooling yeah, effect yeah i just i've figured and and, and, it, and they're a little more the panels are can be a little more efficient mm -hmm. they get less efficient when they get hot oh, okay so all right so you're, you're going to use and that's kind of i was like i don't know I, I, for some reason i'm thinking that the solar panels are going to be like see-through or translucent is maybe a better word. And it was going to kind of heat up the water a little bit and there'd be some more. And I was like, maybe we could, but I, I, now that I think about it, the more I thought about it, I, was like, I think I feel like solar panels are pretty much black um, for the most part. Yeah. And that, that's yeah, what you would be using. They'll be at an angle though. So there will be some sun, but you know, the water evaporation is caused by both, the solar radiation from the sun, but also by the wind, mm. because you're you're as water evaporates, you're, the wind blows that evaporated water out, so the water becomes the air becomes dry, yep, and then more evaporates. So you need to have drier air above the water to evaporate, and the wind replenishes by blowing that humid air out and bringing dry air in. So it's both the wind and the sun yep. that provides the advantage <laughs> the old chinook winds of eastern and, and uh central oregon i was like i, I asked i was like in third grade i should have known that why if it snows so much over the towards the east why is there why is it a rainforest like it's because of the wind it, it sucks up all this it's called a chinook wind i was like oh shit i should have known that good good call roger <laughs> <laughs> take you back to your youth. yeah <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> I've forgotten so much of what I learned in school. It's not even funny. Um, no, that that is so. When is this project? Uh, and you may have said that, but I got excited. But um, when is it going to be implemented again? Is it in twenty twenty two, or is this going to be something that is going to be in twenty three? Well, we the uh, design is in in progress right now, okay. so. Yeah, and and but they need to get more detailed drawings put together, and then they can put it out to bid for a contractor 
to build it. Mm-hmm. So if that goes smoothly, they should start construction in just a few months. Oh, wow. Now, now there may be supply chain issues, so it may not be ready by December, but hopefully early in 23 if at the, at the latest, yeah. That's awesome. Got, got to make sure there's a contractor available that can do it for the for the amount of money we have available and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're going to be able to kind of study this and test how much power is this going to be able to produce? Like, is this going to be enough to power uh, a small town? Or I'm kind of curious to, like, once this test project goes live, how much power are you guys hypothesizing you're going to generate? Think of it more as, as a neighborhood or a... a uh, you know, a small a commercial area, it's going to be about, I think, maybe five to seven megawatts of installed capacity. Mm-hmm. And, and so I haven't done the calculation as to how much it's going to produce, but we're, we're also looking to couple storage with it so that the uh, electricity can be put into the distribution lines when it's needed rather than when it's, when it's produced. Yeah. I, because again, yeah, I worked. You want to make it useful. Yes, I almost worked for a company that was a startup. They built. Think of like a shipping containers, like a twenty foot shipping container, and they were giant batteries. And they, what they would do is they would get charged up during the day through solar or wind, and then they would diffuse into the grid at night as needed, and then the the process would repeat, so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know why I didn't take that job now, but, um, uh, that, that, okay. that's probably, I'm assuming that would, you would be connected to something like that. I don't even remember the name of that company. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, the, the project developer is a, a company called startup company called solar aqua grid. There are, there are partners. So there, uh, they have a, a solar engineer who's working with the designer and they're looking at, some um, right now conventional uh, flow battery, I think, uh, storage. But the nice thing is that Turlock Irrigation District has its electricity distribution lines at, right along the canal. So they can put the electricity into the canal wherever they want. Oh, nice. Yeah. That is, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty sweet, actually. Why, do you know why they decided yeah. to go that way? Well, that's just the way they developed because they they developed as an irrigation district, but they serve both water and electricity to the agricultural area, and then they just expanded to serve electricity to the communities too. Oh, that's pretty cool. So in your yeah. opinion, what are some of the hidden costs of this? Not, And I'm not talking financial. Like everything has a cost. So what are you guys afraid of? Like, let's say this initiative takes off. Are you worried that this might, that this might inhibit water, migrating waterfowl that might be landing using these, uh, these uh, irrigation uh, canals as breeding or food stops? Like, what, what, are, what do you think is going to be a cost um, to wide implementation of this that we might not, that you're hypothesizing well, or thinking of? Yeah, I, our hypothesis is that it will not be an issue for for birds, and we have a research partner who works for the Audubon Society who's agreed to to be a partner in this and evaluate it, and that's his hypothesis too. So it's not just me; it's 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 somebody who knows what he's doing mm-hmm. with uh, with birds. One of the concerns that we have for scaling is that can we come up with a standard design so that the engineering costs are manageable? Because if you have to re-engineer every canal and every section, that that's going to be an extra cost there. So right now, if, if you have an open field and you want to build a solar, you take an off-the-shelf design mm-hmm. and you buy an off-the-shelf system to put on there. There's there's project developers that have those available to, to roll out quickly. So we, we need to we need to you know, just get at the, get at what's, what's the best design. Can we get by with three or four designs? Because some of these canals run north, south, some run east, west. 
Some are 15 feet wide, some are 120 feet wide. <laughs> how many different designs do we need to do? And then, you know, how many of the canals can we cover? Uh, what will be the acceptance by other irrigation districts and by other, other agencies? Will they view it as something that's beneficial or something that's an extra cost that's not really part of what they traditionally like to do? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, see, I see more on co-benefits than on costs. And one thing that we have to do is, is evaluate and see how we can monetize some of the co-benefits. Meaning if you're shading the canal, you're not gonna have the aquatic weed growth and algae growth in there, meaning you don't have to go in and clean it out <laughs> as often. Well, can we get by with having to go once a year or no times a year or what, you know, what's, what's that gonna result in? Uh, so is there gonna be some savings to the canal operator and labor cost savings that, uh, and equipment cost savings, they don't have to do the, the, the clean outs there. Yeah, that's. And yeah, and then, um, you know, we, we wanna try to do this to excite the public about, you know, solar energy and, and building solar energy over their, over existing infrastructure rather than taking uh, you know, unused land, rather than taking land that could be used either for crop land or its biodiversity value and so forth. I definitely, yeah, because that was my next question is like, how are you going to get other, and now Turlock signed up for it, but how are you going to get other municipalities to join on? And I, I like the co-benefit thing, like, but you know, what is their incentive and your incentive, their incentive could be cost savings, but I'm assuming, I feel like that is going to be a, an uphill battle. Turlock is a very interesting place, a good place to start, especially that they have, you know, access to the, the, the grid is based off of these canals and there'll be, it'll be a super solution. You just, you just hook it, hook it up and diffuse into the grid. But a lot of, I'm assuming that th that is a pretty unique scenario and that most, most of these uh, aqua, most of the, the canal uh, counties aren't like that, I would assume. Well, yeah, we actually don't know how many, but it's. I, I think there's enough to keep us busy for a while, yeah. where where there's a a good synergy synergy there. You know, one of Turlock's key motivations, again, was not having to buy land because they wanted to put in solar. They do want to put in more solar, but they don't own any more land. Yep. So they said, "Hey, let's just use the land we have." Yeah. It and uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this to go down. I want to see how it works. I can't wait to see the papers that, that come from this because this, this could be a very viable solution to a, a large problem. Um, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we'd love to get uh, an installation. You know, the, some of the canals cross the, the interstate freeway, Highway 5 and Highway 99, the big north-south highways mm -hmm. that run from – you know, Highway 5 runs the length of California. If we could have those by as, as rest stops where people would stop and charge their electric vehicles and so forth, and if it could fit into, you know, in, into the whole electric vehicle system, because there are many places where canals are near highways and freeways and so forth. Oh, yeah. So there's just... So many possibilities there, and and I think that's what could help capture the imagination of the public, because you know California is committed to converting its transportation from fossil fuels to to electricity, and and we're looking at uh, yeah you know, I'm, I'm I'm also I'm also encouraged because there's now uh, a proposition that I guess will be delayed till till next year prop prop thirty to put real money into these electrification efforts, into building the infrastructure for electric vehicles, into subsidies for electric vehicles, and also to help reduce forest fire emissions. Yeah. Oh, well, this, what I love about you is you're a doer. 
You're, you know, you, you, ca- I know you care because you're, you're out here and you're spearheading these projects and working with people and connecting, you know, people, people such as yourself drive us forward. Um, and I, I think that's cool. I, I didn't even think about the electrical vehicle component, but I, I do know that this is, that this is going to be a problem with the, the, the increased demand from the grid and creative solutions such as this one are needed. So it's interesting and it's really cool to see that, it's really cool to see that you're doing this. And I mean, I, I did, I wouldn't have even known about it if it wasn't for John. He's, he's, he's terminally online and always looking, <laughs> he's always looking, <laughs> looking up stuff. Um, th- there was, I'm always surfing nature for, for, uh, research articles and stuff. Always. Uh, there was one, uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, and it, and it had to do with, uh, it was a video that I'd watched and uh, hopefully this is this is able to refresh your memory in terms of, I, I believe, the ecology of California. There was a I believe you were mentioning that it actually puts out more um, not pollutants, but maybe it's CO2 than it actually abs- scrubs. I don't know. I'm, I'm losing my mind and I could be talking out of my ass. Does this ring a bell well, to you? Our- our Sierra Nevada forests are carbon sources and not carbon sinks. That's what it is. Thank you. I mean, right now we have two wildfires right around Yosemite. I used to live up in that area mm-hmm. and it's, they're pumping out a lot of CO2. So high severity wildfires are our largest, one of our, our largest single source transportation altogether is larger, but, uh, Wildfires are, are 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 huge. So if we can knock the severity of wildfires down and have beneficial, low severity wildfires, those provide ecosystem benefits by keeping the the forest more open. Yeah, keeping the the dense shrub growth from happening and 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 uh, keeping the number of small trees to a, a, a reasonable number. And and so if we can have these low severity, maybe fires with a flame length, a foot or two or foot or so, Mm -hmm. instead of eight or nine feet. Yeah. Yeah. So we, so we're trying to reduce the fuel loads in the forests. And you're, and you're, you're doing that by what thinning of the forests and, and taking like, how are you doing this to, how are you managing? Yeah. They're called stewardship contracts because it's not really logging. You're taking out the small stuff and leaving the, the larger trees. Yeah. To provide, still provide the canopy cover, and but you're taking out the ladder fuel. So if there is a fire, it stays on the ground. It doesn't jump up to the canopy and burn everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and there's strong evidence that uh, there's good evidence. It's mostly anecdotal at this point, but there's we and others are doing studies to to put some numbers behind it. There's evidence that the thinning that has happened has been effective. Oh yeah. At keeping the fire down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's nice when 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 one of your predictions that you hope is good comes out well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I think I think that that's uh, that's what I yeah I wanted to kind of discuss that. So, uh, in terms of um, everything we've discussed, are you an optimist? Do you think that? you know, we are going to be able to change and we're going to be able to solve, going to be able to get all the microplastic and send the pollutants out of the ocean, then that we're going to eventually be stewards of this planet. Or do you think we're fucked? I think I'm optimistic that we can engage a larger segment of the public because right now we need reasoned debate and we need good climate solutions policy. Mm -hmm. And right now we don't get that at either in the Congress. We don't, reason debate isn't limited to just climate. It's, it's a bigger problem than that. So, and we've got, we still have the power of corporate money. Yeah. That's, you know, the fossil fuel industry pulling the strings in state legislatures, as well as in, in, in Congress for too many of the elected officials. So, the, I mean, I'm optimistic that awareness will lead to more widespread political interest and action. 
because it it's going to take a movement to counter yeah. <laughs> the effects of big money. And we have to counter the effects of big money to get reason debate and good climate solutions. I would say that the awareness is there, but I think that the follow through and the people that are making people aware are probably the worst people to be doing that. Like, for example, <laughs> I don't disagree. Like, listen, don't disagree. Leonardo DiCaprio, dog. I love your, you're an amazing actor, but the fact that you fly around in a private jet and are then telling others to move around on a yacht and then are telling others like, you guys need to take less, man. That just doesn't, I don't think that jives. There's no follow through there. It's like, I need all of you to not do anything while I live my best life. John, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Bales, I had a question. Um, since you are an environmental engineer, um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the recent Supreme Court rulings that essentially gutted the you know Clean Air and Clean Water Act and the EPA's uh, ability to solve these issues. Oh yeah, that's a that's an unfortunate product, um, and I think we have the Supreme Court. We have we're just going to have to find workarounds. And I, I think in this in this particular case, the workarounds are going to be much easier than some of the other Supreme Court decisions that are coming down. Yeah. 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 So it's it's it shouldn't be there. It's going to ramp up costs, but we can still get there. <laughs> That's good because I had I that was my I don't know enough about the kind of operating mechanisms of all these different efforts well, to, to know whether or not that would be like a crippling thing or if it's just kind of a setback and everybody just has to pivot and figure out another direction. The, the risk is it, it may be dependent on who's in the White House. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Oh, I don't No, We're not. That's time for uh, that's, that's a conversation for a bummer cast, but uh, that's that's what two years away now. What, the, what a disaster that is going to be! My goodness, I'm going to move just just for the election, and then when when the president whoever wins, then I'll fly back because I don't want to have to deal with the ads and social well, media. And until until you move, go around knocking on doors and <laughs> deep deep deep. Uh, what do they call it? Deep canvassing, deep, uh, deep uh, outreach. Can I, no, yeah. I think it's called canvassing. You're right, but I would, I would, I would want. I mean, I would want to be elected uh, president. No, I, no one. I wouldn't want that job. And believe me, you wouldn't want me to be the president of the free world. No, but uh, identify someone who you would like to see and get out there. <laughs> Ron Paul. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's the challenge. Um, yeah. Well, we'll, well, we'll go ahead. No, go ahead. I was yeah. going to say, um, yeah, I want to be respectful of your time, and I really appreciate you coming on. And, and please, when this launches, um, we'll definitely reach back out, or you know, we'll we'll stay in communication because I'd love to get like how this uh, an understanding of how this project is going. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, if you have any books or anything that you want to plug, social media, anything of that nature, please feel free. This is the time. Yeah, sure. I can send you a. A note: I don't have any books. I can uh, a couple. Some of what I said, I can give you a link to a couple pe pieces in the conversation. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. You're familiar with that publication, yeah? Yeah. I uh, I haven't had time to write a book. I've written so many papers, but uh, there's a couple pieces in there that encapsulate what I said about both the solar canals and the uh, forest management. I have a website, rogerbales.com, which I try to keep up to date. I want to plug some films that I'm working with the Chronicles Group, a nonprofit filmmaker on, on the uh, forest and water issues. <clears throat> so I'll give a link to their websites, beyondthebrink.global. Okay. We have a 27-minute film being distributed on PBS nationwide right wow, now. Wow, fantastic. We've got a follow-up film for the fall that's be. He decided to wait till the summer's over and release it in the fall. Yeah, and it's a fifty-seven-minute uh, 
film that dives deeper into climate solutions. And uh, let's see, I have a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? You 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 active on Twitter? Uh, as much as I can. Sometimes I get underwater and I have to just <laughs> Step set it aside for a few yeah, days. Yeah. But I, I try to do at least one a day and sometimes four or five. That's yeah. nice. It's your beer better than me. I, I'm, I'm not like, I need to get back into tweeting to, to, to grow this. I need to do t- deep targeted interactions every day, but it's so soul sucking and I got to uh, do it. I just don't have time for that. I know yeah. it's kind of where I'm at too. <laughs> Um, all right, perfect. Well, we'll we'll put that it up on our website and then uh, throughout our socials and share that information. Again, I really appreciate, appreciate you. It. I appreciate you coming on here. I appreciate the work you're doing. Please keep it up. And and uh, I'm I'm happy that you're optimistic. We've had some uh, client climate scientists that are not optimistic. They're very upset, and you know, rightly so. But I, it's nice to talk to an optimist and uh, you know someone that's. A more a little bit more analytical so that was it was it was a pleasure chatting with you and and uh, we'll have to do it again okay we'll keep up the good work rick and, and john it's a pleasure to to meet you and uh carry on all right <laughs> yeah. all right folks thank you so much for listening uh we'll we'll, we'll see you next week peace and love mm-hmm.